Well, it's just the plain oddity of multifurrier itself. Oh, just the um, just how unusual these characters are, and how how the interactions would go along with that. That I mean, initially, furry, I started into furry because it was so unusual from what I was seeing in mainstream, and then it got layered on. I was looking for more and more unusual stuff, and this is as unusual as I can get. <laughs> uh, my personal take to it, um, along with that, the unusual aspect, was I was always happy with the uh, concept of the extra power and ability that I consider multi-furry gives. You talk to people who are macrophiles or you know, you know muscle uh, lovers, and they will all tell you, you know, in their image, in their minds, how much power, how much ability that they have. Well, really, multi-furry is no different, except uh, instead of sheer size or bulk, we're dealing with um, uh, numbers. We're dealing with uh, additional flexibility, uh, multitasking, of course. Um, where it comes to hands, arms, those kinds of things. Uh, when it comes to legs, stability, strength. Speed sometimes, depending on which uh, character that you actually have. Uh, heads, uh, when, people, when somebody has like a, a Cerberus or a Hydra character, or just even just a regular character with two heads, even a conjoined twin, as it were, uh, there is a dual processing. You know, for the technophiles out there, a dual processor computer is better than a single processor. <laughs> Why not process it to furries? And that's the same kind of concept. Tails, well, they just look sexy. <laughs> Can't really argue much more than that. Um, what I wanted to do as the first part of the presentation is give a little bit of history. And when I say history, obviously there have been no more to multi-furries in reality. So sad, very sad. But there has been a lot of mythology that basically talks about this. The mythos of multi-furry. And, of course, everyone knows the big names, the Cerberus, the Hydra, I've named a couple of those. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot uh, in certain areas of the world that you would not expect to see. Uh, myths come from just about everywhere. Uh, usually when you think on mythos and multi-limbed or multi-faceted, you think Indian, you think Hindu, you think uh, Vishnu, you think uh, Kali. You think of all those, uh, those uh, ones where the uh, extra arms do denote, denote the extra power. But you have Greece, you have Romania, we're going to see things from Japan, from China, uh, we're going to see from Korea and India, we're also going to see from the Norse myth and even Serbia, and even uh, Native America. So really, we are going to be uh, globe hopping and seeing some of the uh, more unusual ways that uh, religions have represented a, uh, uh, a, either a feral or an anthropomorphic beast that has more. So with that, I want to go ahead and start. We're doing this alphabetically. We're going to start with the Balor. Uh, the Balor, as you can see here, has uh, different variations. Uh, it is Romanian origin. So when I was talking about Romania, this is one of their uh, main monsters of myth. And uh, yeah, Striker, when I press OK, it goes two at a time, not one. Ooh, or maybe doubling it. Yeah, you might as well just uh, go I with know, that. I know, multi furry twice, yeah. so we know once, but uh, I think I might just use. Uh, let me see. You don't have two heads. Yes. <laughs> not yet. Um, I'll just do it here then. I think that's going to be easier. Uh, Romanian origin, as I said, it is uh, characterized as a serpent with 3 to 12 heads. So, um, for example, for those who are knowledgeable about the Hydra, as a, uh, as a creature of myth, you can see how this also ties into other sections. Uh, uh, Romania being relatively close to Greece, you have the similarities between the Greek multi-headed creatures and this one. Of course, Greek has quite a few, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, it's a fairy tale character, typically representing evil. And usually that's the concept of a lot of mythos where multi-furry is involved. Uh, there is the impression that, oh, they have more heads. They must be evil. They must be this big monstrosity. 
Uh, Strecker was talking earlier about the oddity of it all and how it struck him. Whereas it struck him and me, and hopefully some of you, as interesting, it struck people of uh, myth and religion as terrifying. And so they made these types of uh, creatures to represent that, maybe also to be therapeutic in a manner. Odd thing about the Balor is it rules precious stones. Interesting. I just like, at that point, I just like to wave a stake under all the heads. You know, come on, Daddy needs a new car. Come on. Uh, one of the cur uh, things I was doing researching these was the Balor. For those who know Greek mythology, uh, should recognize the name Bellifron. Uh, Bellifron was a Greek hero who uh, rode Pegasus and defeated the Chimera. One we're going to see a little bit later on. You'll notice that Bellifron and the Balor have, again, a very similar starting style. And again, that shows where uh, a lot of these myths borrow from each other. Um, you know, it's said, like, for example, in writing and movies and TV, that there are no more original ideas. Well, maybe that was the same way back then. They just borrowed what was convenient to them, and that's where we got the Balor. The next one we're going to look at is the Basilisk. People may remember those. Who plays D&D? Raise your hands. Or who has played D&D? Quite a few. So you know this guy here and that guy there. Uh, that one happens to be, of course, the one from World of Warcraft, yes. some, some game I've heard of. <laughs> um, it is actually the Basilisk one. During my research, uh, a lot of people don't know exactly where it came from. It is Cathabrian, Old Spain. And that's unusual for a lot of people because they, they don't look at something like this and think Spanish. They usually think something along the lines of more, again, Mediterranean uh, levels. But it is uh, Cathedral in nature. Typically a lizard with either six or eight legs. Sometimes more. Uh, depends upon you know how that person feels about legs. Of course, best known for D&D, &D, as I've mentioned. Uh, there's actually a phrase, and I don't have it handy, but if you looked it up in the Bible, Isaiah 14, 29, it does actually name one of the older, uh, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's King James or one of the other variants, but it does mention the basilisk specifically. So again, we have a borrowing of uh, concepts between cultures. I also noted uh, in my research a, a line in Shakespeare's Richard III. A widow was basically comparing... Uh, the compliment from a murderer uh, of her brother to that of the gay uh, wishes that her eyes were like the basilisk so that she could stone him. Uh, of course, the basilisk, those who know it, that was its main power, but it was also incredibly quick, probably because of all those legs. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, extra legs slows them down. Not so with the basilisk. Speedy little effort. The next one, the bukabak. Bukabak. You can notice also, uh, that one's obviously a more uh, uh, deviant art version of it. Uh, the, the top one, of course, is the style that was made uh, straight from uh, the Slavic uh, people. And, of course, this is being a Slavic origin creature. Uh, the uh, five- or six-legged dragon, you can see where it's the five-legged uh, version. And that also brings up another aspect uh, give me just a moment to finish this one. Uh, it brings up another aspect of uh, symmetry versus non-symmetry. Uh, symmetrical multifurries tend to be more pleasing to the eyes than asymmetrical. And I think for those who are artists, that is also the case. You know, if you're looking at art, um, symmetrics pleases the human eye. When you look at a half mirror or something like that, you expect the other half to be the same, pretty much, maybe with minor differences. An asymmetrical shape tends to put people off. And since, again, this is a monster, that's kind of the similar. Yes? Uh, I got the quote from King James. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Isaiah 14, 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, a.k.a. a basilisk, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Thank you, sis. Yeah, appreciate that. cockatrice is bird. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in that aspect of it, they usually use them the same time. I've heard of it, the basilisk and the cockatrice basically being the same thing. Either a, uh, a bird that with their, uh, their attack made them on stone or the lizard uh, stone. Uh, we have differentiated it in terms of the D&D &D 
and our aspects to it, but back then it was pretty much one and the same. Okay. Well, plus mythology is kind of tra hard to track down to one specific idea Absolutely. about one name, because there's this so is, many variations. This is in no way uh, the absolute end of all knowledge to this. Of course, there's a lot more to it, but it's all that could show on one page. Uh, this is actually Serbian, the Bukovac. Uh, it is uh, from the Srem mythos. Um, I don't know what Srem means offhand, but it's fun to say. Srem, Srem, Srem. The Serbian word for noise is buka, thus the name of the monster. The Bukovac starts with the word buka. Now you may wonder what the heck noise really has to do with this. And stampede. when I first pardon <laughs> A stampede. Actually, it's very close to that. Uh, preferred mode of attack, jumping out, making noise, and then strangling victims. <laughs> All, yeah, it's just a booga, 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 booga. That's, that was the book of that. Um, and <laughs> Too bad they don't, didn't see if it was more like bonsai or something What's like that. that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wreck it. <laughs> yeah. Would you shout bonsai anyway? It just means plant tree. <laughs> Makes about as much sense as anything else they might shout while they're trying. <laughs> oh. At that point, you're like strangling the victims like, Ah, ah Cerberus. Cerberus. However you want to call it, it's basically the three-headed dog. Both in the Pharaoh version, sub, I, I, I'm seeing some of these names of recognition here. That was, that, uh, that uh, specifically was my favorite to bring up. Um, of course, Cerberus is a Greek origin. A uh, little quiz, what was Cerberus's uh, function? Yeah, Guarding the gates of hell, uh, normally represented as a three-headed dog, sometimes with a snake tail, sometimes not. Uh, this, uh, that one there it just has a dragonish tail. It uh, is a variant of that, but it is indeed a three-headed uh, dog. Um, and seen in Greek myth, too many fantasy games to name, and lousy Disney movies. Don't forget the Philosopher's Stone. And Harry Potter. And, oh, yes, Harry Potter. Uh, as a matter of... Uh, yeah, that, there's, it's uh, basically in a whole bunch of places. Uh, and that's one of the most popular mentalities when you come against something like the Cerberus. Is, oh, yes, I know exactly what it's supposed to look like. It's a three-headed dog. What type of dog? Bulldog. There, now there is where uh, all the variants go away because people think of like a guard dog and aspect, something like that. I've actually seen one as a uh, Cerberus was a three headed schnauzer. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> just, right. 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 Um, and uh, again, when you deal with multiple headedness, you deal with the concept of is it one mind controlling all three heads and all three bodies, or is it three separate personalities? When you look at it fairly, you think one mind. You think it's just one concept that's uh, doing all these. They don't necessarily really fight amongst each other. And then you look at um, things, for example, oh, uh, before I get into that, Cerberus, born of Echidna, the, the myth behind this. Born of Echidna, uh, the guardian of the underworld. Uh, the the uh, Cerberus is the guardian of the world. Tamed by Orpheus, captured by Hercules, and in the case of Minerva here, made sexy by the fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Damn Skippy. Zoldok does have a lot of interesting ideas on the brain, sort of multiple head thing. Yeah, and yeah. We'll, we'll get to that with uh, later discussions with Stryker. Uh, but I just wanted to, uh, but a lot of people had different mentalities of how uh, many headed creatures, especially like the Cerberus and the Hydra, how they really react. If you go from feral to anthropomorphic, there's definitely a shift in, in context. In fact, there's been some research by Xerox on this, which I'll get into later on about it. The next one up the Chimera. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, interesting with the chimera here is, again, there's a, a design variance. Uh, when I say chimera, uh, technically, uh, it means patchwork. Uh, when you look at it gen with the genetics, a chimera is a, usually a hybrid of some sort. They take multiple aspects and put them all together. Well, the chimera, spe uh, specifically, and, it w and all those concepts from genetics was based off of Greek myth, the chimera, basically the fusion of lion, goat, and dragon head, sometimes even a snake tail. The top image, for example, shows actually four aspects, where uh, a lot of people see three with respect to a traditional chimera. 
Uh, aside from mythology, also seen in Homer's The Iliad, uh, being a Greek myth, of course, it's going to see its way into a lot of Homer's epics. Also seen in Godzilla, various uh, animated works, fantasy games. Just uh, make sure it's the original Godzilla from Japan, not the latest one, which never had the hanging rack New York. Right, it's region locked. Um, and also born of Echidna was uh, defeated by Bellafron, as I mentioned earlier. So Gozira, not Godzilla? Gozira. Yeah. No. Uh, but, but one more thing, usually considered female. Now that's an interesting thing. When a lot of people think about the chimera, they think male, be, especially because of the lion's head. That is a male lion's head. Yeah, but with a mane and everything. But by all Greek myth uh, anecdotes and accounts, it is a female monster. Huh. Also born uh, of the spawn of Echidna. Echidna, for those not familiar with it, she made some nasty creatures. This being one of them. Of course, you know, nasty to everybody else, and I look and go, myrrh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if the original interpretations had a mane and horns or not either, so it's kind of hard to tell. Again, it's, it's uh, being a bit mytholo mythology, nobody had one to go by. Right. So they just built and built and built. This one, at least one of the words should be very familiar. The yeah, others are uh, different variations of it. The uh, Hulijin, Kumiho, or Kitsune. The uh, Hulijin, the Kumiho, are the Chinese and Korean versions of that. As a matter of fact, the bottom image there of the, uh, uh, the half uh, girl, half Kitsune, uh, that is actually, that came up when I did the search of the Kumiho. So that was the uh, uh, Korean version of it. Uh, of course, everybody knows on um, the Kitsune, Fox Spirit, Shapeshifter, Trickster, uh, just like the uh, Native American Coyote was, and traditionally the number of tails indicated the power level, which uh, then, of course, you go online and you see like a hundred-tailed Kitsune and you wonder, well, why haven't you destroyed the world yeah. yet? Yeah. Uh, and exactly. they say, well, I'm getting to it, and I'm like, yeah, power gamer, go. Uh, ancient art... Anime, fur art, repositories, you can find just about anywhere. Yes? I've heard a lot of people also use the number of tails as to indicate age. That is true, too. Like um, but typically, the they equate like age that. with power. Right. But not necessarily the same. Typically, yes. But, you know, everyone's uh, interpretation is relatively right. different. But this is, uh, usually comes from the uh, variants on Japanese and the Asian mythologies, mm -hmm. where they did indicate that, because they would usually have stories about how they would grow tails as they, uh, 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 a lot of times, let me see if it's in here, uh, Chinese mythos are actually the only ones to cast the Huli Jing in a positive light. Everybody else treats it as a demon spirit, as uh, something that it should be feared. Uh, but there was a uh, Chinese poet, Pu Song Ling, that actually made love stories based between a female, uh, a female Huli Jing and a normal human boy. And uh, I actually had a chance to read through uh, some of those. It was, uh, it was quite eye-opening for this time. Is uh, it more feral or sort of anthro or...? It starts with Pharaoh, okay. uh, and then it comes to uh, like the uh, picture of the Kumiho in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, usually, it starts with the shape-shifting where they appear as normal human, and then they show off their Kitsune status. So similar to a Tanuki in some ways. Exactly. Okay. Next one up. The Hydra. Yeah, we had to put it in. Of course. Pictures of plenty. That bottom one happens to be one of my favorites. It's actually one of my desktop pictures. No, you can't. But I, I can put it up here. I just have to, I have to cut this card. Uh, Greek origin, of course, those who know about it. It's a water serpent with uh, three to nine heads. Now, one of the uh, concepts, of course, seen in Greek myth, too many fantasy games, and lousy Disney movies. I will say this, though. The Hydra was the only reason I watched Hercules. Everything else could go away. That one, I was just yeah, happy. Um, the, I'm not sure how many people know about that, but the Hydra is notorious for having the uh, overcompensation of you cut off one head and it grows two back in. That is only for the Lernaean Hydra. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Lernaean Hydra. Uh, the swamp uh, of uh, Lernia was where it was during one of Hercules' labors, and that's where it got its head. Uh, uh, name from, the Lernaean aspect. Uh, 
of course, in the myth, the only way to stop it from uh, growing out at that point uh, or, and totally overwhelming was to apply fire to the necks as uh, you cut off the heads. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure who did this. I think it might have actually been uh, two who had said this once. But it's like, if this, if this was like a hydra, I keep cutting off heads until it had like 100,000 or something like that and let it just... <laughs> <laughs> fall yeah. forward because it couldn't move and the back legs would just be like that and you could sell tickets. I was just wondering if you're limited by FC or if we could actually just check everyone's badges and then if everyone's okay with it, do 18 plus stuff. It, it has to be after a certain time. It has to be after a certain time, really. So. I do happen to have some 18 plus stuff, but I'm not sharing it out here. Uh, after that, maybe I might be able to um, have people come up and take a quick look at it. But beyond that, it's to sa it's also to save our butts because, as you know, there is a volleyball tournament Ooh, that's also yeah. being held out here too, and, and the kids more. all look underage. Yeah, not not gonna. We do not want to demand their minds any more than what the first shooters <laughs> have already. <laughs> Be funny to try. <laughs> the Jutonio. The Zhufeng actually is a many-headed uh, bird uh, hu from the Hubei province, kingdom of Chu, about 450, 220 BC. So this is ancient. This is, uh, predates uh, a lot of what we know uh, concerning some of the Serbian myths even, too. Nine-headed bird, considered actually the first Chinese phoenix, although it did not have the same properties of the phoenix as we know of it. Uh, that may have sprung from this. But the nine-headed bird was specific to the Chinese mythos, uh, seen in the literature of Shan Jing, and also as a totem animal, uh, which also proves that there is a, a pull from totem totem animal uh, totem spirits between mythos. It's not just to, to the Native American, but we will see that later too. Uh, this one specific, of course, to China. The legend actually said it had ten heads. But the tenth head was shot off by a certain person uh, who remains nameless, and the geophone basically hunts uh, relentlessly. Um, if I recall, in my research of this particular one, it said in order to defeat this, you leave out alcohol. Because they'll drink themselves silly. Wow. Uh, so this is basically to the ranking griffin. Essentially. <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it, sure. <laughs> I'm telling you said that. Uh, Ladon. Before I re reveal this, anybody know who Ladon was? No. Lay down you? Seeming more familiar? No. No? Guardian of the Garden of Hesperides, the Golden oh, Apples. For those familiar with the Greek uh, with the Greek myths of Hercules, this was actually one of his labors, one of the later ones, I think 11, uh, where he basically had to get one of the Golden Apples from the Garden of Hesperides, but it was guarded by a rather large and many-headed serpent, dragon of a hundred heads. Take that, Hydra! Nice. <laughs> Overachiever to this point. Uh, another of Echidna Spawn, I'd mentioned that uh, she just basically made some bad Momo Jojo, and this is it. Uh, some works, uh, Aristophanes, the frogs, claimed that all of Ladon's heads spoke with different voices. And I think this is one of the first times in uh, my history, uh, my research of uh, mythology, that I'd seen the multiple-headed creature have the multiple personalities that goes with each head. Ladon was typically represented in this manner. Um, they had to be to be able to spot and uh, process in a whole bunch of different ways. Now whether or not that proceeded to different personalities, different uh, mental states, that's up for <laughs> subjugation. Unfortunately, Ladon is not around today to confirm or deny. Um, this also lands one question, is that is Ladon one of the first creatures that actually was um, anthropomorphic in mythology. That would... Um, I mean, if it, if it spoke with multiple heads, that would assume a humanoid personality. A humanoid personality, but there have been many uh, in instances, for example, even going back to Cerberus, where the, uh, the dog, an obviously feral dog, would speak from the heads, but still would not be considered anything more than just, you know, the dog with the speech patterns and yeah. a couple extra craniums.
On some quick Googling on that tenth head on the Jiu Fang, I found a couple of references about how it was a mob of people who attacked it, and mm -hmm. someone shot it, so the bird doesn't really know who did it. Right, so that's why it's kind of person. going out over after everyone. Right, and it's darkness and dogs, I think, uh, was uh, one of the ways that it also was done. So alcohol Yeah, you blow out the lights and then let their dogs out. Right. The Naga. Now, some people uh, might be like, well, wait a minute, I know Nagas, and they don't have multiple lens. Well, some of them do. Um, now, yeah, again, World of Warcraft, people go, we're in a Warcraft, we're in a Warcraft. Uh, mm -hmm. But here, uh, actually, the Naga's history, the uh, starting point of it was from India, Nepal, Bali, so in that Indonesian region. Um, the typical Naga, as you may know, is uh, just considered half uh, humanoid, half snake. But the more powerful versions have tended to be with four to six arms. And if you think about it, again, where I referenced earlier on that a lot of Hindu mythology endows more powers to those with more limbs, that's the same kind of concept. These were typically the more powerful, the lieutenants of the Naga tribe, so it were. Uh, the Maha... Oh, my God, I can't say this. Mahabharata? Mahabharata? Is that correct? Mahabharata. The Hakuna Matata, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Sanskrit narrative of the Kurukshetra War. Uh, it does actually uh, mention them there as well as, of course, in the mythos themselves. Uh, again, mostly in fantasy films as we've seen them and gaming, World of Warcraft being more specific to that. Um, one of the curious things I found was I'd show this to people and they'd say, oh, that's a Merilith. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, well, no, wait a minute, there's a Naga from the, from the old one. No, it's a Merilith. It's a six-armed snake demon, which basically borrowed it from the Naga mythos of old. So that's where the Merilith came from, specifically, to this. Orthus. Anybody have any ideas? Sounds, Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. Sounds uh, people's like, well, I shared you somewhere before. Ah. Or this is a two-headed dog. Uh, for those who are familiar with Greek, myth, uh, Greek myths, uh, who is familiar with the name Gerion? Or Gerion? Oh, Gerion. Yeah. Gerion. Drago, who was Gerion? No, oh. I'm more familiar with him from his appearance in the first edition of D&D, but I think he was one of the monsters that Hercules fought. That's all I remember. Absolutely. Gerion was one of Hercules' labors. He was a three-bodied giant, which oh. means uh, you've seen probably some of Star Strikers or others' uh, artwork where they had one pair of legs, but at the, uh, t uh, the waist, they branched off into three separate upper bodies. That was Gerion. He had a dog. The dog was Orthus. Also uh, was all considered the little brother of Cerberus, so he was part of Echidna's brood as well. <laughs> Typical design for the Hellhound in fantasy and horror games. Um, somebody name me an example. One of the games that had the two-headed dog, I think. Uh, was um, God of War. God of War. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, I've seen, a, I've seen an anime uh, also yeah. where, they, where they had that too as like oh. a mutant uh, dog. Uh, I can't remember the name of it myself. I think it was Demon City Shinjuku. Yeah, that, that's it. That would have been it, yes. Uh, where they basically had the same kind of thing, and I think somebody referred to it, I'm not sure, somewhere in it, uh, as uh, Orthus or uh, one of the translations, somebody had mentioned that. And again, borrowing from Greek myth. I saw a hand back there. Hey, Nico, you had a hand? Was it a two or three headed? I think it was two and maybe it grew a third. No, it, it, it three. I, I remember. I remember the boss. I remember, I remember that boss. Remember that boss. Um. Orthus, like, like I said, was the guard dog of Garion, uh, slain uh, three headed body giant slain by Hercules. Uh, Hercules had to go through Orthus, unfortunately, to get to Garion. Uh, so, poor doggy. All he wants is some loving. Maybe your right arm. <laughs> <laughs> and give him a steak. Scylla. Scylla. Again, Greek mythos. Boy, those wacky Greeks. <laughs> Located in the Strait of Messina. It's between Italy and Sicily. And the, uh, the multi-aspect, as you can see, uh, from the waist up, normal human woman. From the waist down, 
tentacle legs with dog heads at the ends. Again, it's one of those uh, aspects where it wasn't sure whether or not those heads had uh, multiple personalities to it or not. Uh, a lot of people said that they didn't, that it was basically her mind controlling them, as unbalanced as that mind was. Seen in Homer's The Odyssey and Ovid's Metamorphoses. And while the origins differ, Scylla is always seen with a uh, sharp... How do you say that? Charybdis. thank you. I keep saying Charybdis. That sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> Destroying ships. One of the uh, aspects, I think it was uh, the Odyssey, where they would basically have to go between the two. Uh, and uh, Charybdis was at one end, Scylla was at the other, at the other side. And uh, if I was going to be, you know... If I was going to have my choice between one of those two, I'd take this one. Yeah, yeah what, what they did is they plugged their useful flags. I'm sorry? Is that where the frames between a rock and a hard place comes from. Yeah. Very right. good. Priscilla would basically take ten crew members as a tithe to pass. Indeed. And sometimes it wouldn't even honor at that point. What are you going to do? I'm a big monster. Go see my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how to say this one. Sisutu? Sisutu. Now, I was talking about Native American before. Pacific Northwest tribes, I live in Washington State, so I actually found a, a good uh, a wealth of information on this. It's a two to three headed serpent, but you're going to notice in the totem here that the heads are typically on the end and a human uh, face is in the middle. Uh, that is actually a, uh, a, a part of the mythos where somebody becomes a warrior by fusing themselves with the Sisuto known as God of Warrior Invincibility, which is why it was so popular around those particular mythos. Uh, seen on totems and masks, as you see here. Actually, uh, in discussions with the tribes that, uh, of, that have this mythos, uh, has anybody ever seen the rubber boa? Seen pictures only. Seen pictures only. Uh, the rubber boa is one of those unusual uh, uh, things, like um, one of the uh, butterflies, for example. It doesn't. It looks like they have uh, head markings on the back end, so you don't know if it's coming or going. The rubber boa was one of those, and it was also indigenous to Pacific Northwest, about the same time as the Seattle, uh mythos came about. So it was uh, always thought of that this is what inspired that particular mythos. In an unrelated note, there is a statue of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, right across the street from this hotel. Diagonally across from the corner of the park, there's a huh. ten foot wide quilled up feathered serpent. Yeah. It looks like a dog turd. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I was gonna say that. that I, I was I was gonna say that, but then tact override me. So <laughs> thank you very much, Drega, <laughs> for you did dog <laughs> <That's why. laughs> Welcome to San Jose. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Now you know why there is the fountain in the middle of it, so... Mazdaq, I'm looking at you. Yeah, it's my dad. <laughs> it's dad! So, how do you pronounce this one? Because uh, Slipnir. Slipnir, Slipna. Okay, Slipnir. <laughs> Nordic and Scandinavian in origin, of course. Uh, Eight-legged horse, the Mount of Odin, king of the Norse gods. Now, before I... Uh, I, I looked look this up, and I was very, very amused by this. <laughs> Apparently, Slipner was... Get back here! <laughs> ...was considered the love child of... I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Svalafari. Svalafari, thank you. And Loki, the trickster god, as a mare. So he decided he was going to take one for the team. That's not exactly wow. what happened. The Svatibari was the giant who was building the walls of Asgard. The deal was if he finished it by a certain time, he would get one of the goddesses as his wife. Hmm. Well, someone had to distract him or his horse, which was helping him build the wall. So Loki turned into a mare to distract the horse so the wall wouldn't get done in time. Hmm. So it wasn't just some random, that horse looked yeah. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the mood for something. Point to get. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the mood for something yeah. horsey. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I, I did not. All, all basically the research on that was just pointed to that it was the child, but I did not know the background to it. So thank you. I do appreciate that. It is creepy. You can think about it as he's riding around with his grandson. <laughs> <laughs> Why you gotta do it on love? Wasn't Odin's son though? Uh, really creepy. Look, he took a anyway. turn. 
<laughs> I didn't no, no, no. I go. I've changed my mind. <laughs> uh, Slipner is a popular ship name in uh, the Nordic uh, uh, range and has a statue in the British town of Weddensbury, England. Uh, for those who know their days of the week, Wedden, Wednesday, Woden's Day, Woden is the English Odin. So that's where Weddensbury comes from, and they have the statue of Slipner there. Now, one other thing is that. Uh, there is also a web browser called Sleepnare that comes out of the Nordic Reach as well, too. It's rather popular in uh, Scandinavia and whatnot, but outside, it's pretty much on hood. I've never heard of it. Now, um, if you go to... Um, if you get a European edition of Windows 7, you are prompted to choose your own browser. The main ones are IE, Firefox, Chrome, Opera. And then you get a list of all the accessory ones like, like Sleep Near. So. Huh. I don't think of him as an accessory. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> I think he's a feature, personally. <laughs> okay. I think we're coming up to the last two here. Teju Yagwa, I think it's uh, how it's pronounced. I should have put in the pronunciations on these as well. <coughs> Um, but these are some of the pictures of this. This is also known as the Lizard Dog in Paraguay Legends and Guarani Mythology. So we're uh, uh, talking about those particular regions. And again, it borrows from a lot of the same kind of multi-headed serpent mythos that's common in uh, multiple furry. The myth, according to uh, the resources, uh, mostly Wikipedia, to this point, of woman was raped by an evil spirit. This rape angered the god of valor enough to curse the children born of the rape. The Tejagwa was the first to be born. Wow. Damn. Poor woman. <laughs> Who is this, a Republican wow. senator? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently. <laughs> you don't do that, I do that. <laughs> well, okay, fine, how about you? But uh, that was, uh, I guess this would be akin to Echidna. Uh, the uh, the Paraguay uh, version of the spawn of all monsters. Only the uh, the way that it got to it was a little bit different. And I think finally, the ah. Maranochi from Japan, circa 700 A.D. Eight-headed snake, typically with eight tails as well. So when you look at that monster, it says eight tails, eight heads, and then one tiny torso <laughs> in the middle that you could grab and wake around. <laughs> Japanese text Kyoyiki and uh, Nihongi uh, again my Japanese is terrible uh, anime of course uh, Naruto or Orichimaru. Orichimaru yeah it looks like it got some manga in there as well too indeed uh, that's uh, one of the images that I uh, pulled for that for that one there by myth uh, slain by Shinto the st uh, Shinto storm god Susanoo to prevent deities from having to sacrifice their children to this thing 